Hello, Chris here from Charity Digital News. Uh, after a few weeks off, uh, we're very pleased to welcome you back to another Charity Digital webinar. Uh, to those of you who've joined us before, it's great to have you back. And to our first time listeners, we hope today's session will be the first of many with our Charity Digital community. Um, for those of you that are new to Charity Digital News, here's a, a quick snippet of, of who we are and what we do. Uh, Charity Digital News is part of Tech Trust, a, a charity focused on helping other charities to maximize their impact through the use of digital technology. As part of our offerings, uh, we've saved charities over 225 million through our TT Exchange program, a program that gives charities access to discount and donated tech products like Microsoft Office, Adobe, uh, Symantec, and, and, and many others. Uh, we also have our own white labeled email platform, uh, TT Mail, uh, that we offer to charities at a discounted rate. It's based on the dot mailer technology and offers a, a fresh alternative to solving some of the pain points that you can have with MailChimp and other platforms. Uh, we also host the Charity Digital Jobs platform, um, which connects charities to top digital recruits looking for their next role. Uh, and of course, there's Charity Digital News, uh, an online education platform that aims to inspire charities to adopt digital tech through articles, events, webinars, and, and a lot more content. Today, we're joined by Nick Hardy, Carl Sedecki, uh, and Carl Sedecki from our newest TD Exchange partners, Breathe HR. And they brought along with them Sandra McClellan, uh, McClellan sorry, and Joanna Morris uh, from HR Inspire. Um, the introduction of GDP, uh, GDPR back a few years ago uh, gave us all a lot to think about, um, no matter of the sector. Uh, and as more and more businesses and organizations are picking up fines, uh, we're uncovering you know, new potential banana skins uh, that could uh, you know, always come back to haunt us. And I think HR is one of those areas. So I'm very excited for today's conversation. Um, last bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, as always, we'll be hosting a, a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so make sure you stick around for that. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can do so anytime by hitting the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if we happen to run out of time before your question is asked, if you're not, uh, we'll record all the answers for you at the end uh, and add them to the record and we'll be sending out in a week, week or so's time. So that's enough for me for now. Um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sandra, Joe, Nick and Carl. Welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, this is Sandra um, from HR Inspire and we are delighted to be supporting this webinar. It is a important topic and we hope that we're going to provide you some valuable and practical HR insight today from us. So a little housekeeping before we kick off. I'd just like to spend a few seconds on who we are and how we work with organisations in the charity sector. Just to give a little context to our experience of HR and GDPR. So on the screen, you'll see there are a few names that we've supported since launching and we support them in a variety of ways. So not primarily through GDPR, but through their um, being their HR support or supporting them on various HR initiatives. But um, we effectively, we are customers, the customers bolt on HR department. So many organisations, they don't have the budget and they'd also potentially don't have the need for a full-time HR function in-house. So we're able to provide that in a really cost-effective way. So our team of HR experts lead by, um, by a HR consultant, provide support um, from proactively managing your HR policies, your processes, your admin and so on, to more responsive work um, around sick leave, performance management, appraisals and so on. Um, our aim at HR Inspire is for you to be focused on achieving your charitable goals, um, but protected by compliant HR practices with teams such as ours that work as productively as possible. So let's start by taking a look at what we'll be covering today. Um, so hopefully today we're going to be able to um, stop and take stock of what we've really seen over the last year since GDPR went live. Um, it felt as if it completely took over our lives. That's all we constantly heard about was GDPR. Um, and we're then going to take a look at the real impact that we've seen um, on the HR environment. So just share with you some examples, of course, not disclosing any confidences or any names because we're aligning with GDPR, of course, but just to give you just some sort of ideas. Um, and following this, we're going to consider the challenges and the poses for today's um, uh, charities. Finishing with some practical advice on how you can meet these challenges. So accountability and empowerment. 
Um, over the last few years, we've really seen a centre um, into this area of uh, increased accountability and empowerment. We, we, you know, it's it's probably quite sort of a, a claim for us all to see that we have moved into very much a culture that um, it's an individual and consumer's rights are at the fore, with organisations being increasingly held accountable for their actions. So this is the driver for GDPR. New regulations and policies are put in place to ensure that organisations are behaving in a way that meets these new expectations that people have around how they, and more importantly, how their personal data is handled. Um, and GDPR exists because we've just seen this alarming number of examples where the amount of our personal data is, um, is now stored, is, is often being exploited. Um, I'm pretty sure that many of us get those numerous telephone calls that we constantly try to bar from people contacting us. Um, and I myself often quote when I get yet another one of those, I'm sure this isn't GDPR compliant, is it? And very luckily the telephone does go down. Um, but for charities, there's so many more sort of pressures, isn't there, as organisations? Um, charities have always been in the spotlight for how they use people's personal information. Um, and I think that's why the charities um, that we work for have really found that the work that we've done for them under this is really useful. And you'll get also to hear um, from Breathe HR, um, one of our partners on their HR software, on how that also really makes them feel comfortable in knowing that they're compliant. So from an employment perspective, it creates an interesting dynamic where you've got internal behaviours are expected to meet the external positive, compassionate reputation, and where charities are increasingly being held accountable for ensuring this happens, with employees becoming more vocal on their rights and their expectations. So it's not easy, is it, being a charity? It's not easy being an employer, um, and especially in this world where everything is just so governed by um, new rules and regulations. So hopefully um looking at one year on um each interestingly um the court decisions are still only a trickle um as is the time scaling scale involved in ico fines we're yet to really see what is the true impact of GT gdpr cases logged pre-gdpr aren't susceptible to the higher fine rates so many are still being processed at the moment so i haven't really got any alarming story to tell you but um i do know that there are sort of a number of increases internally around people doing lots of subject access requests which i'll give you some examples in a moment um but we have seen these sort of two key trends one year on a four times increase in number of data breaches logged, um, demonstrating organisations stepping up and taking ownership where issues occur. And secondly, a significant increase in employee demanding access to their data. And as I say, we'll cover that later. What it is showing is that GDPR is empowering people to have their complaints heard. Um, and people are just taking full opportunity to do so, both personally and professionally. So it's clear that an employer in it's it's clear that as an employer, having your employees trust is really key. Um, under GDPR, um, there are six key principles that you should already be abiding by to help support this trust. Number one um, is security. And this is about, and, and even really before GDPR, if you think about it, you want to, you wanted to be in a position where you are looking after the data that you've got. Um, and we'll touch on this later when Breathe will give us an overview of their leading HR software. But it's safe to say Excel spreadsheets, filing cabinets, they just don't cut it anymore. Um, you must ensure that your employees' data is kept in a secure manner, doing all you can to ensure a breach does not occur. It also, one of the key principles is it has to be relevant. So the data that you're keeping on somebody has to be aligned to the reason why you're holding it. So for example, you'll hold somebody's date of birth. Of course you will, because it's for payroll purposes. Um, however, storing that sensitive data, um, such as someone's ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, 
if you need it, you have to gain permission and have a reason such as diversity reporting. But remember, employees have always got the right to say no. Access. Only relevant people have access to data. So who has that key to that filing cabinet where everything's kept? Oh, that's right. It's kept in so-and-so's drawer, isn't it? And anybody can pop along to that and, and, and get in and have a look at data. Um, but again, Breathe HR is going to give you some really good examples of how the software in Breathe HR really does um, eliminate that. Um, accurate. Data should be accurate. You need to maintain it. Gone are the days of old paper forms in drawers. The data should be live as the people you employ. Um, the next two are around your employee rights. Um, it's the right to know, which is, as you've heard me mention just before, it's that data subject has the right to know what data you hold about them. Then the right to also be forgotten needs to ensure that data subject has the right to be forgotten. So your ex-employees. So what's a real and practical impact of this shift in behavior? So the impact on today's HR environment, really, it's a key trend we're seeing is that employees are more empowered. They know their rights. They're more confident to use those rights as well. Secondly, charities are more accountable you must take full responsibility, as you know, for your employees, but it's not only your employees, it's also um, your volunteers, your trustees. You have such a wider, wider aspect of things that you are accountable for in charities. That's my view. That's how I see it from a HR practical perspective. Um, and the combination of these two is a significant rise in the number of subject access requests. So at HR Inspire, we look after around 130 small to medium sized businesses. And I would say that probably 20% of those are charities that we look after. And the subject access requests that we have helped our businesses with have actually interestingly come from charities. Um, and I just think that's just because there's just so many more people. So the real impact and risk to your charity. So what is this subject access request that this woman Sandra keeps on mentioning all the time? It's really the fact that it's any person that the charity has personal data about can make a request for what's stored about them. It's probably not any different to what it used to be before. All it is, is that now it's something that is so more out there that people know that they can do this. And it's also, interestingly, doesn't cost anything. Where before, um, there used to be a lovely little process where somebody used to say, I want to see what's on my farm. We used to have a fee that we used to charge them for it. Um, and there was no limit to it. You could do whatever you wanted. But now, of course, um, you have to provide the people with that information. Um, it's important to consider the implications of this on your charity and what those risks are. Um, it's also important um, to remember that the impact and risk to your charity is the potential reputational damage of being perceived as a poor employer on recruitment, donations, volunteers and more, not to mention the fines from the ICO if not handled properly. Um, I think it's 4% of your um, annual turnover um, is what the fine can be if you don't do things correctly. Um, as well as the obvious categories of people, such as donors, members and customers who make a data subject access request. It, as I mentioned, it includes your employees, your volunteers, your trustees. So each organisation will need to know how and why and where it holds its information about each of these categories. Subject access request. Um, what are the changes under GDPR? Um, so I've mentioned before that there's no fee um, unless the request is manifestly unfounded or excessive. Um, the other changes and new responsibilities under subject access is that it's 30 days, not 40 to respond. Um, and I can say that the option to extend by up to 60 days in limited circumstances does get um, honoured because we've had a number of uh, these where we've had to put that request in because there is so much information that we need to gather. Um, a greater level of information to be supplied 
um, and subject access requests, requests no longer have to be made in writing, and that's really quite key. So your responsibility to provide all data to be, it needs to be provided. So all the personal data that you hold about the employee, including anything you might hold on your practice management system, paper spreadsheets. If somebody wants to have access, access to anything, it really is everything. The data needs to be provided in a secure format, and that doesn't mean you can't use paper, but if you do, you will need to make sure that photocopies are legible and they're either collected in person or securely dispatched by recorded delivery um, and courier. So again, this is all as you can start to see some really additional costs coming in here. Um, if you provide the data electronically, it needs to be in an intelligible form, readable, et cetera. Um, the data needs to be understandable by the employee, i.e. they can read it and an average person can understand what it means. And the data must be provided at no cost to your employee. So what's our practical HR advice? What's the best way to handle these challenges that we've just sort of just spoken about? Um, I don't have a, a single approach answer um, to ensure your charity is, is protected. Um, remember a disgruntled employee, I, this is my, my belief, real strong belief, that a disgruntled employee is far more likely to raise a, a, a SAR, a subject access request. An employee, employee who trusts your charity, they feel included, they're really well managed, they're valued and they're looked after, is not necessarily going to be an employee who feels that they need to investigate what's being held about them. If you're transparent and you're honest and you have conversations with people about their performance, about how they may well have made somebody feel, um, it's far more likely that you're going to get a subject access request. It's about sort of ensuring that all of the pieces of the puzzle our approach, so your culture, your processes, and your technology. So from a HR Inspires perspective, it really is about the fact that if you, if you need HR support within your business, or you need then in helping you with engagement and communication with your people, if you need support with your processes to align it, and then you've got technology, that is to me, which is the practical advice to reduce these. Um, just let's just break that down. Just on culture, um, your employee experience is really directly it sort of impacts how valued they feel and how much they trust you as their employer. Um, as we've covered the charities, there is certainly an increased expectation here. Um, and I don't sort of envy you that as an, as an employer myself of 16 people, I, I know how difficult this can be, but demonstrating GDPR compliance is reflected in your approach to employee relations. So if you're transparent and you're open, um, cultural audits, that's a lovely new term at the moment. It used to be, it's just a lovely another term for an engagement survey, but how good does it sound when you're actually saying, we want to do a survey with you on how are we culturally fitting with what we should be doing? Um, appraisals and reviews, the good old appraisal and reviews, you know, making sure that they are aligned to how are you feeling in respect to also how are you doing. Um, you also have some strong internal communications. So people are really clear that when, you know, something as simple as when somebody is leaving and what are you going to be doing about that job? Um, so somebody doesn't feel that something's being done to them and they're not aware of different changes within your organisation. And just regular check-ins. So when you look at that really, culturally wise, it isn't necessarily rocket science, it's just about ensuring that you've got just sort of some stepping stones there. Processes. Now these are the things that under GDPR, it's important that you have. So it's in support of these cultural behaviours, there should be some clear policies and processes. And some of you may well already have these from when sort of you went um, aligned with GDPR, you know, when it came through last year. But it really is about having your employee privacy policy, your employee contract amended in order to ensure that all the correct terminology is in there. So you're not talking about data protection, you're talking about GDPR, your employee handbooks, handbook supports all the changes for GDPR. 
your SAR process, so that's the new one. Um, I think we had always sort of had something about um, access to personal data, but it's just about ensuring that you've got some sort of policy. Data protection policy, data retention policy, and job application privacy policy. So from a HR practical perspective, these, were the sorts, these are the sorts of things that your HR department would provide for you, for you and your people in order to ensure that your GDPR compliance. Now on the technology side, um, technology enables us to easily adopt GDPR compliant processes. Um, and these processes are the fact that it's is around the fact that you need to consider that it's got it's secure. So where I talked before about the fact that it was um, it's not an Excel spreadsheet and it's not a filing cabinet that's in the office where everybody can get access to. Um, it's relevant. So again, I think that um, it's very much about making sure that if you do have any information on somebody, it's relevant. It's not a little bit of hearsay about what you think about somebody, even about even being careful when you are um, interviewing somebody and you write something about them on the application form and that application form is then going into their personnel file. Um, it's a fact that somebody can get to see that once if they put a subject access request, those sorts of things. Um, it's also about making sure who has access um, and it's about making sure that it's accurate and it's right to know and as I nearly forgot on my slide right at the beginning <laughs> it's a right to be forgotten and um, so what do you do when people leave um, so technology side um, when I am um, speaking to people about HR support from HR Inspire I have a real real sense of support in being able to at the same time offer them um, brief HR as a partner that we work with um, and who better talk about that but is Nick with regards to technology. Brilliant thanks very much Sandra um, really insightful there and um, clearly many many challenges with um, GDPR compliance so today I'm just going to provide um, a fairly brief um, high level overview of, of Breathe, um, who we are and what we provide. Um, so I'll start with uh, just a, a general introduction um, to put it into context, how it supports GDPR, and then specifically look at each of those six principles that Sandra spoke about uh, and how our software um, can address um, each of those and help over graduate challenges. So in a nutshell, Breathe is um, a cloud-based HR management system um, it provides very easy to use, secure, reliable way of managing um, all information related to employees and volunteers. Um, so when we say information, that could be, could be policy, it could be handbooks, CVs, holiday requests, bookings, absences, the list goes on and on. Um, so if we look first of all at the first principle of security, obviously security is of paramount importance. Um, and our software, it's hosted in the cloud. Um, we use Amazon Web Services um, and data is um, hosted in their state-of-the-art data center facilities. Um, it's ISO 2701 accredited, which is the highest level of certification um, for online data management. Um, as well as AWS being ICO accredited, so are we as a company as well. It's something that um, we take security um, so, so seriously. So all information um, is stored centrally within Breathe. Um, it's username and password protected. Um, and we'll come on to permissions shortly. Um, so that's a very important um, aspect of security. Um, and in terms of uptime, um, we work towards 99.9% .9 availability, um, which is pretty well the end as industry um, norm. Um, it, last year, I think we had downtime of a couple of minutes, and that was it in the entire year. So, if you compare that to your own server infrastructure, um, obviously there's a, that's a cost involved in supporting that and making sure that everything's um, safe and secure. Um, it can be, you know, if you compare it to sort of what's available these days via um, within data center facilities, you get a lot of bang for your buck there. Um, so, if we go to the next principle, relevance. Um, so what our software does is that it enables you just to keep that information that's relevant um, to an employee or volunteer, and then basically you can sort of you know then start to think about deleting anything that's that's that's, that's not relevant. Um, so this is an important aspect, and um, we'll come to see how and shortly how employees can also access the information. 
So access, um, this is very, very important. And Breathe, in our software, um, there's basically several levels of permission um, which can be granted to people based on um, their role and what they do. Um, so if you have a look at the bullets um, there, that basically is the list of seven that can be, um, that you, you can, that can be selected. Um, so this is very important and very you know, key to making sure people can only see what they're authorised to see and um, they, they're, not, they're not seeing things that um, really are not relevant to them. So, as Sandra mentioned, um, you know, with the, with the new regulations about SARS and um, the rules that, you know, people have to know what access you hold about them, um, our system is self-service. Breathe is, allows employees to access the information that an organisation holds about them. So, I mean, visibility and transparency there, um, very important. Um, you know, gone are the days where you'd be sort of searching around with those filing cabinets and spreadsheets, looking to gather that information with um, data siloed in sort of different systems, having it all in one place. You know, it's just so much easier for somebody to see what you hold of, of, of them. Um, and also the right to be forgotten. So delete means delete with Breathe. So once information is deleted, um, you know, there's no going back. That can't be undone. And that's very, very important as well, because as soon as there's a back door there, that's open to, um, well, potential complications, which could put you on a, um, in conflict with the ICO there. So the last of the principles is um, accuracy. Um, you know, you want employee and volunteer information, which can change um, over time, to be as accurate as possible. So let's say, for example, an employee changes mobile number um, or they change an address, they could be changing anything. Our system allows them to go in and update that information. So it takes really the sort of the pressure off um, an HR administrator to have to do that on their behalf. And so ensuring that information, you've got the right next to king details, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's very important for smooth running. So, That's my side of it now. So uh, I'm just going to hand back to Chris now, um, so we can um, hopefully answer some questions that are coming through. Uh, <coughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Nick, and thanks to you both, uh, Sandra and Nick, for that, that great insight. I, we were chatting beforehand before we kicked off the webinar about how you know you hear GDPR and it, it automatically spells you know I'm a I'm a top line from a marketing point of view with people who who I'm speaking to, but uh, and that often leads to things like HR. Um, getting overlooked but that was a, a, an amazing insight first of all from Sandra into you know these six key principles that we sh as charity should all be following by um, and I think we can kind of hold that up as a as a light to, to aim towards and then thanks thanks Nick for adding some digital application to that well how we can use technology and um, as a sector to to really um, to bulk that up um, so let's dive into some questions um, let's have a look first of all from Tracy. And um, it's got a question about SARs. Uh, so it's it's a general question about how someone can access an SAR. Can they request it via telephone or via uh, or verbal request that doesn't have to be written or via email? It can be anything. It really can. So um, where before. Um, if you wanted to access data, you had to put something in writing, official, etc. And um, people can just ask. Um, you'd normally would generally say if you could actually, uh, you, you, you would probably even confirm back to them that that request because there's always this need, isn't there, to feel that there's something in writing. Um, but that's it. Really, is the case of that someone doesn't have to go through a process to ask to see something about themselves to do a subject access request. What we would provide as a HR support is in our process and our policy that we produce for our customers, we do produce a form and that form may not necessarily be something that somebody has to fill out, but the, the, the HR department or the person that's in charge of HR will, will gather all of the information from them. So it's a, it's a route into conversation type of document. Great, I think that leads quite nicely into our, into our next, um, you know, next question as well, which is, which is uh, if a client from say two years ago requests an SAR, um, what, what can you share as an organisation? Um, there are certain time limits actually with regards to what you keep and for how long you keep it for. Um, 
I think that if somebody that had worked for you a couple of years asked for something, um, it generally would be, well, what is it that you're meant to have? You, you'd still use it the same. Something like um, there are things that you have to take off um, of your information. So uh, the end, probably the longest thing that you'd keep is your redundancy details, calculations of payments, refunds. They're the types of things that you have to keep for six years from the date of redundancy, e.g. six years from the date of them leaving. But things such as investigation notes to do with grievances, you basically um, don't have to keep those from six months following conclusion. So there's an example of where if they've left you a couple of years ago, you wouldn't have to produce those documents. So hopefully that answers that. But there's a whole list of time scales for things. Great. Um, so just next up from uh, Phil. Um, doesn't your duty under law to retain employee records trump their rights to be forgotten? Sorry, what was the question? Doesn't, um, your... doesn't the duty under law to retain employer records kind of oversee the, override the right to be forgotten? That's the, that's the similar question to before in the oh. fact of actually, it's about um, retention really. So if you had a retention policy, um, you would be able to, to list everywhere as to what you're meant to keep and in law wise, what you're meant to, so it's like there's a limitation act, but there's three year limitation for negligence of a known act or incident um, during working for that company and it's such things as driving offences, remove once the conviction spent, um, drug and alcohol testing, six years from positive results. So there are things that are linked to um, legal issues and that's what you would list if you had a, re if you had a really good retention policy um, those would be the things that you would list in there. Great. There's a question from Tom, what about safeguarding issues? Um, how long would you look to retain evidence about this? Um, again, this would be in your retention policy. I'm sorry to keep referring back <laughs> to it, but um, it is something that uh, from a HR practical perspective, you would have all of this information in that policy. Um, so from a safeguarding um, perspective, you would align your retention policy to the law on safeguarding. Mm -hmm. So. Um, there would that you, you would see as to how long it is that you should be able to keep that. I've, I've got something um, I can give the answer to that in more detail. Yeah, I think the next question was going to be kind of is there any information out there where you know employees and organisations and charities can can find with regards to like timelines and how they can, I how can long they can retain yeah, data. I can put that online for you. Great, yeah. um, we'll get that after and then uh, we'll send that out on our resources as well. Um, Next question from Grim. Um, can the brief system be expanded to administer uh, membership and organization and its service users as well as recognized volunteers? Sure. Um, so people outside of the charity. Yeah. Uh, we the, the, the platform itself would only record employees so, so yeah so i think the question is more like not not just um employees to be kind of expand can it be used for volunteers can it be used for um i can help answer that from from um hr perspective so we have um a number of businesses other than charities that would have people that are not um an employee per se and um, they may well be a contractor a consultant an associate um, so similar to in charities where you have people that are volunteers, so they're not necessarily on your payroll. So um, it just really is just a category that we just put them under. So they, be, so because a volunteer wouldn't be entitled to paid holiday, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not on breathe. All it means is that they don't they don't put holidays through breathe. They, but they can still use brief for the really good practical um, aspect of putting on their per putting on their personal details, them having access to change their address, and all of those sort of practical things that you need for them. Um, because you know your volunteers are very much like your employees. The only thing is they're not your employees. I know that's contradicting itself, mm -hmm. but from a point of view of putting having information and data in one place, the answer is yes. It can just go all on the same. Same, same one. Great, thank you for that. Um, we may have touched on this a little bit earlier, but I don't think we went into too much detail. Um, 
this question about if we've kept data longer than need to, um, like longer than the required um, period, mm. uh, and then SAR is received, are you uh, required to disclose it as it is, or um, even though you haven't, there's no need to keep no, it? No, but, it, but then that's, the answer is no, you don't have to, because there are certain timescales as to what you should be sharing with people. Um, and, but then that's also saying you need to get your house in order in order to remove the information that there isn't a need for you to have. Um, so it's a case of if somebody asks, has a request, you do have to provide all the information you have on them. So your, my recommendation is, is that if you aren't in that situation where you've got your personnel files, for want of a better, better phrase, in order, now is the time for you to take a look at that. And if you are going to be transferring over onto a software system such as Breathe, then we work with people as a HR department in ensuring that we're only putting on Breathe what needs to be on Breathe, and we're removing stuff and shredding stuff and getting rid of the information that doesn't need to be kept. Great. Um, and I know one of the key principles is kind of the right to forget. And um, we have a question from Simon here. It's like, um, if an employee leaves, what level of information should be retained and for how long? I assume the right to forget is. <laughs> Again, it's um, so, for example, where people, um, if someone's left and it's a reference that you would have got on them, you would keep on their folder, their, their file for a year and then it would be removed. Um, such things such as sickness and injury records and work related so things that are listed under health and health and safety that's one year following completion of a request for, um, and sort of things such as whistleblowing reports and documents linked to an investigation again six months following the outcome of the report um, so that's a couple of examples yeah i think this is really useful information i think we'll gather think, that as well and, and send out I was going to say, I think one of the key things to kind of be mindful of is that there are so many different categories of data and you can kind of get into the granular detail of how long can I keep this, that and the other for. But the point that Sandra goes back to around a retention policy is that that is a document that your employees have access to and within it, it stipulates the different data that you collect and how long you retain that for. So when those questions come in, you are able to refer back to that policy and demonstrate yeah. that data and how long you've got it for and why. Yeah. So when um, GDPR was coming through, we just made sure that where I showed you earlier, what, what would be the, the key things that you needed to do from a HR perspective um, that you had in place in order to protect yourself. And those were those, those sort of six key yeah. things. And one of those is the in retention policy I'd cover you. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, that's all the questions we've had in so far. Um, so I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. Huge thank you again to Sandra, Joe, Nick, and Carl. Um, if you if you'd like to reach out with them, you can do so by um, by following the, the information on this on the screen here, um, the contact information, or you can uh, you can you can check out Breathe on our TT Exchange program. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar along with some additional resources. Uh, I think there's, there's plenty we can. Uh, we can certainly gather up to share, um, from especially from a retention policy standpoint. <laughs> I think. Um, don't forget a little bit of housekeeping. If you don't mind to to go back and fill in our feedback form that we we'll send out after this, uh, it's a really quick two minute survey, and it goes a long way to help us continuously improve our webinar service and um, to bring you the best possible. Um, a quick look to next week. Um, we have AWS joining us to find out if you uh, managed to find the silver lining in your cloud yet. Um, we'll be addressing some of the concerns that many charities share and hopefully cut through some of the jargon to help you understand what the real benefits of the cloud can be for your charity. Um, if you're not signed up, you can do so by heading over to charitydigitalnews.co.uk forward slash webinars and we'll hope to see you next week. Um, we'll be sending out an email with uh, all the resources for this slide in the next week as well. Thank you all again and we'll see you soon.